Um, this video is going to be on the first part of chapter 39, 39.1 and 39.2 and this is about motor mechanisms. So this is how um, your muscles work, contraction. Um, and it actually is a really good extension of what we've been talking about last uh, few days about the nervous system because the nervous system and um, action potentials uh, in specific the uh, neurotransmitter acetylcholine, um, especially for skeletal muscles, is what uh, stimulates them to contract. So what we're going to start looking at first is muscle anatomy to understand the structure of a muscle. So muscle cells contract, um, contraction depends um, on thin and thick filaments sliding past each other. So um, what we're going to do is basically take a muscle and a muscle cell, muscles are um, long, striated, uh, thin strands. And um, in muscle cells, or rather muscle cells are composed of um, thin and thick filaments. And these uh, thin and thick filaments are composed of two different proteins. Um, thin filaments, um, which in this picture are uh, the yellow lines, are made up of actin, a protein called actin, and the thick filaments represented by these purple lines are represented are made up of a protein called myosin. So actin myosin make up um, basically a, a muscle muscle tissue. Um, and the sliding of this actin and myosin, these proteins, past each other, they can elongation or, or, or shortening causes the contraction, elongation and contraction of a muscle. Um, and this uh, contract, the sliding motion past each other, um, requires ATP energy. So it's an energetic process. Everybody knows, or you know from com personal experience, that using your muscles is energetic. It takes energy. So a single muscle cell is a very long, is very long and very thin, and it contains um, a bundle. One cell contains a bundle of these thick and thin filaments all bundled together in like a circle. And that bundle is called a myofibril. So here we've got um, a single muscle cell. And a muscle cell has many nuclei because a single muscle cell in adulthood, so even in your bodies, is made from the fusion of many embryonic um, cells earlier on. So that's why they have many nuclei. nuclei. And so a muscle cell is contained um, a bundle of myofibril. So here is a myofibril, uh, a bundle of those um, thick and thin filaments all stacked together. Um, and the myofibril is kind of chopped up um, vertically into many repeating segments. And each one of these segments is called a sarcomere. Right? And that sarcomere is composed of um, what's down here, a, uh, these single segment myosin and then actin bordering, bordering them either side. So um, a muscle cell made up of myofibrils chopped into sarcomeres or divided into sarcomeres. And uh, the sarcomere is composed of these segments of myosin um, with bordering actin, like this. So, the sliding filament model represents how we believe, or physiologically, how muscles contract. So muscles contract by having the myosin and actin in each sarcomere slide past each other. So here maybe is in the relaxed state, and when it contracts, the uh, myosin kind of uh, pulls itself in both directions. So the actin um, comes in this way. And then we have a contracted muscle cell, or contracted, fully contracting. See, we have the um, actin coming close together, and a fully contracted muscle cell um, will look like this. The myosin completely takes up the sarcomere like that. Um, and here is a... Um, picture of uh, actual relaxed and contracting and fully contracted um, sarcomere. 
How that happens, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about how this process happens physiologically with this next picture. All right? So the first thing to know is that um, myosin is made up of um, this long strand of myosin and protein. It has these little heads. They kind of look like um, round matchstick ends that poke out of the myosin. One myosin strand might have 350 of those little heads. And those myosin heads are very important because it's what causes the movement of, of the myosin. So starting out with a fully um, relaxed sarcomere, so um, kind of in the resting part, the first thing is um, the myosin head is bound to ATP energy. And it's in its low energy fig configuration. So our myosin head is laying rather flat um, with an ATP bound to it. Um, then when the uh, myosin filament needs to contract, we get the stimulus from contraction, um, the myosin head hydrolyzes or cleaves one of the phosphates off of that ATP to form ADP. And um, when that happens, this myosin head becomes very energetic and actually binds to actin. So we've got these heads binding to actin, and it forms this cross bridge. Then the ADP is released from myosin, and myosin, in return, returns to its low energy configuration. And in so doing, it slides down the actin filament. So it kind of pushes, pushes against the actin filament, um, moves the, uh, the, the myosin um, this way. So moving it this way, moving it this way, uh, closing this gap. And then resets itself by binding a new ATP on. So this cycle occurs over and over again, using up ATP, attaching to the uh, actin filament cross bridge, losing the ADP, pushing its way down the actin filament, and then resetting with a, uh, by rebinding ATP. All right? So um, the speed that this works at uh, uh, um, depends on AP, ATP supply and being able to replenish our used ADP with phosphate. So um, muscle cells uh, get the energy they need to contract from food by uh, oxidative phosphorylation, creating ATP in the electron transport chain in the glycolysis. Um, also by breaking down stored glycogen and turning it into glucose to use in the um, glycolysis. And there's actually another uh, compound, which you'll learn a lot about if you get into kinesiology or medicine, which is... Uh, called creatine phosphate. And what creatine phosphate does is stick another inorganic phosphate group onto ADP, resupplying your body with ATP. Um, you use up your creatine phosphate supplies in about 15 seconds of muscular um, contraction. You use up the ATP from glycogen or glycogenolysis glyco, um, in about a minute, but oxidative um, catabolism, like from oxidative respiration, you can, can you sustain muscle contractions for up to an hour that way. All right. Kind of last part of the story is calcium, and calcium is really important for muscle contractions. M calcium regulates the contraction of, of skeletal muscles. So um, in actin, so this is, let's go back here, this is actin, this is actin. In your actin, you have um, what is called uh, protein complexes as part of actin. And one of those protein complexes, this thin purple band called tropomyosin, and um, another important complex is called this troponin complex, which is these purple dots. And they, their interactions with calcium allow muscle contraction to occur. Um, tropomycin covers um, the myosin binding site. So these um, little dots here is where the myosin head right here binds and forms that cross bridge on um, actin. 
Um, and tropomycin in a relaxed state covers this tropo, this, uh, the tropomycin rather in a relaxed state covers these myosin binding sites on actin. However, when calcium is able to bind with the troponin complex, it causes a configuration change in tropomycin. It rolls out of the way and opens up these spots for your um, myosin heads to bind to actin. So calcium needs to be um, binding to the troponin complex to open up or to cause tropomycin to move out of the way to open up the myosin binding sites. So how is muscle uh, how is a muscle stimulated to contract? So acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that um, motor neurons secrete to activate muscle contraction. So at the edge here of this motor neuron and the synapse, um, acetylcholine is secreted and it creates an action potential in the muscle cell, right? And the action potential travels along this muscle cell, travels along this muscle cell, till it reaches these holes, and these are called T-tubules. And uh, from the T-tubules, the action potential goes down into the T-tubules, um, and it's a folding in the membrane, and the action potential reaches a specialized endoplasmic um, reticulum called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, or SR. And that SR, like in uh, normal cells, it contains a lot of proteins and things. In muscle cells, that too, but it also contains a lot of calcium, right? And when that action potential reaches this uh, kind of bluish area, which is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it stimulates it to release that calcium through uh, voltage-gated calcium ion channels. And it releases that calcium into the cytosol um, of the muscle cell where all of the microfibrils, the actin and myosin, um, and the sarcomeres are. And so once that uh, calcium is released into the cytoplasm, it can then bind with uh, the troponin complex um, and, sorry, with, not with tropomycin, with troponin complex and cause the contraction of the muscle fibers we talked about before. So then re relaxation is stimulated to happen when first the ADP and phosphate become unbound from the myosin head and when calcium is pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum using calcium pumps. And that makes the tropomycin cover back up the myosin binding site and ATP um, is, uh, ADP rather, um, comes detached from the myosin head. So in a picture, it looks like this. Um, our motor neuron releases acetylcholine um, that enters or that stimulates, that opens a voltage-gated ion channel like we talked about last time to stimulate an action potential to travel along the membrane. It reaches a T-tubule and fouls through the T-tubule into the sarcoplasmic reticulum that holds all the calcium. That action potential opens a voltage-gated calcium channel, which causes calcium to travel into the cytosol and bind onto the troponin complex, um, open up the uh, myosin binding site, and we got a contraction of the muscle fiber. Then calcium is pumped back out through the uh, ATPase pumps, and our tro tropomyosin covers up our myosin binding sites, and our calcium is resequestered in our uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. The last thing I want to talk about is nervous control over the muscles. So your nervous system has two ways of altering the force of muscle contractions. I can pick up a heavy object or also a light object. I can vary my contractions of muscles. And there's two ways to do that. Um, varying frequency of contraction, making a contraction harder or softer, or varying the number of muscle fibers that contract at one time. So each motor neuron, so these are different motor neurons, the green and the blue coming from your spinal cord, um, may synapse with many different muscles. So this one green motor neuron can split apart and synapse with many different 
muscle fibrils or myofibrils. However, each myofibril only synapses with one motor neuron. So one of these myofibrils doesn't synapse with both motor neuron unit one or two. So um, a motor unit is one um, neuron and all of the myofibrils it synapses with. So all fibers in a motor unit contract as a group. So all of these ones attached to the green motor unit, motor uh, neuron are a motor unit and they contract together. All the ones attached to the blue uh, neuron are the blue motor, neuro, motor unit and contract together. So you can vary the strength of contraction by your brain telling only motor unit one to contract or both motor unit one and two, or just motor unit two. That's how you can have different dexteral um, uh, responses in your fingers versus your whole arm. Or it can vary how um, frequent these impulses are sent and how strong the contraction is. All right, that's about it here for this segment um, of 39.1 and 39.2, and I'll see you all in class.